everyone and welcome to this video. At this point you've probably watched A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the prequel movie and book about Coriolanus Snow, the president of Panem, and how he rose to become the absolutely awful human being uh, that he is in the original trilogy. But amidst this TikTok fascination with him and all the thirst traps that I've seen of Tom Blythe, have you ever stopped to wonder what was the inspiration for this character? Well, you might actually be surprised that his character has this Shakespearean origin from a play that is very often forgotten despite it having a historical significance in the real world. And it actually shares his name because it's also called Coriolanus. Trust me, you won't want to miss these interesting details that I found. But before we move on, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe so that YouTube can notice this video. Coriolanus is a tragedy revolving around a Roman general called Caius Martius, who after winning almost single-handedly the battle for Coriolee, gets granted the honorific third name Coriolanus. Despite his victory, Rome faces dissent amongst its plebeians, the common people, due to starvation and resource scarcity. At his mother's, Volumnia's, suggestions, he runs for consul on the back of his military feats. Though he is initially accepted, three scheming politicians manipulate the plebeians into turning against him, leading to his exile. Coriolanus joins up with the people he helped defeat in Coriolee to attack Rome, including his greatest rival Ophidius, with whom he has a lot of chemistry. In the end, Volumnia persuades him to pursue a peace treaty instead, but feeling both betrayed and envious, Ophidius ultimately murders Coriolanus in the play's finale. Moving forward to differentiate between Coriolanus from The Hunger Games and Coriolanus from the Shakespeare play, I will use Snow to describe the Hunger Games character and Martius to talk about the Shakespearean one. So I'll preface this immediately by saying that Ballad is not a retelling of Coriolanus by Shakespeare, but there's a lot of interesting thematic beats that are uh, shared by the two works and some characters that have the same names or that play the same roles. And I'd like to highlight those for you because I think it really adds to the understanding of A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. So first off, both Martius and Snow get exiled from their very affluent la life in the capital. Of course, Snow is only secretly affluent, but he still has this pretense, right? After this exile that they go through, they end up aligning themselves, at least for a while, with the foil to that affluent lifestyle of Panem and Rome. And for Martius, this is the Volskis, aka the people that he defeats in Coriolee, and for Snow, this is obviously District 12 and Lucy Gray. Both these characters are very important for our Coriolanuses because they ultimately play a very important role in shaping their narratives. The big difference is when it comes to the influence that Ophidius and Lucy Gray have on Snow and Martius is that Snow is still in the process of becoming the Hunger Games villain. He's not in that, you know, evil president that like wants to kill everyone uh, state that we see him in The Hunger Games, but Martius is a fixed, flat character. He doesn't really change over the course of the play, so Ophidius doesn't really help him grow in any way. It's more just that element of Martius keeps having this very passionate feeling towards Ophidius and keeps pursuing him um, in the middle of battles. He always drops things just to go and fight his number one enemy. Make of that what you will. <laughs> And during this exile period, they have very different motivations at this point as well be because they're just in different parts of the story. So Martius at this point is just fueled with this rage and wants to really get back at all the Roman citizens because he feels betrayed by them because they exiled him. Whereas Snow, at least in the beginning, uh, really wants to give this life with Lucy Gray a go, you know? He hangs out with the peacekeepers, he hangs out uh, with the coven, 
but in the end, when he realizes that there is an opening for him to go back to the capital, he ultimately takes it. So, so the difference is that Martius, in the beginning, really wants to get back at the Romans, whereas Coriolanus just is happy to do his own thing with his girl, at least for a while. However, Snow returning to the capital and wanting to manipulate himself into this bigger place of power uh, brings me actually to my next point. So this was actually the first thing that jumped out at me when reading the play. It turns out that Martius's mother is actually called Volumnia. And at first I didn't understand why this name was so familiar to me, but then it clicked. Dr. Gall, um, Viola Davis's character, the crazy scientist lady who is the game maker of the games and invents the rainbow snakes. Her, she has the same name as Martius's mother in the play. And I found this very interesting because I find that their roles of Dr. Gall and Volumnia the mother are quite similar until we get to the end. Arguably, Dr. Gull is the most influential person after Lucy Gray when it comes to impact on how Snow sees the world by the end of uh, the movie and book. I mean, the, the movie does end with Volumnia asking why does the capital hold the Hunger Games, and Coriolanus concludes that humanity is chaotic and animalistic in nature, and therefore it has to be reminded of this brutality that it is able to bestow upon others. And because of those conclusions that he makes at the end of the movie, um, a lot in part due to Volumnia's or Dr. Gall's um, tampering. Because of those conclusions, we he becomes the president that we see in the original Hunger Games where he is uh, he rules with an iron fist, you know? If you believe that humanity is so chaotic and animalistic, then obviously you're gonna implement a lot of very harsh rules because you believe that you need them to control the people you're ruling. And you might be surprised that this is actually not dissimilar to the impact of Coriolan as the play in the real world. So actually, Nazi Germany used Coriolan as the play uh, in their schools to teach kids about how uh, this totalitarian regime would be better. They kind of painted Coriolanus as a hero and used him as a figurehead for a fascist regime. So this is very interestingly contrasted with Volumnia's role in the play Coriolanus because she, her role at the end is to convince Corio to spare Rome. But of course that's not to say that there are no similarities between Dr. Gall and Volumnia the mother because Volumnia also really influences Mar Martius's uh, worldview. I mean, she is the one that gets him into politics in the first place, it gets him into fighting in the war in the first place. She, in the beginning of the play, almost uses Martius as her means to advancing in the society. So I found it very interesting that Suzanne Collins decided to borrow this name from the play because Ultimately, Volumnia is the person that controls everything from behind the scenes in both uh, the play and the movie, and you're never really quite sure where her head's at. She really gives me Aes Sedai energy, to be honest, from the Wheel of Time, so shout out to Wheel of Time fans. And by now you might be thinking, Vera, okay, but you do realize that Snow was introduced originally in the Hunger Games trilogy, not the associated prequel. And I'll be like, yes, but I thought about that as well. So I see the reason why Suzanne Collins would pick Snow as uh, the primary antagonist for the original trilogy and call him Coriolanus is because I see the state of Panem um, in the beginning of the first book as kind of being a what if Ophidius didn't murder Martius and Martius did end up ruling over Rome, Rome becoming Panem. I mean, there's the similarity between Ophidius and Lucy Gray where Ophidius murders Martius and Lucy Gray, it is very possible that she attempts to murder President Snow. So it's kind of the idea of, okay, what are the consequences of that? if someone with that worldview comes to power. 
What really connects the two characters in their approach to humanity is that they're just very contemptuous of the citizens that they're supposed to lead. So Marcius, in the beginning of the play, um, when he's trying to gather votes for his election to become consul, which is like president, which ultimately leads to his exile, he actually, after getting the votes, um, he starts insulting his citizens. And even right before he gets exiled, there's a scene where his mother and uh, one of the other politicians tells him to kind of calm down and not be so rude all the time because he can't be rude to people and then expect them to have good sentiments towards him. And because he is such an awful person, he, that makes it so much easier to man manipulate the populace to go against him. And then Coriolanus, he also has contempt for the tributes. Even though he gets that connection with Lucy Gray, he see he still doesn't really care about all the other tributes. In the book, he constantly refers to Lucy as my Lucy Gray. He doesn't ever really see the tributes as his equal. And just like Martius, the way that Snow treats his citizens ultimately leads to them starting to rebel. And I think that this parallel right here is actually why Collins decided to use the name Coriolanus for her main villain. Overall, I find it so interesting how echoes of Shakespeare can be found in modern uh, literature and modern films. I really enjoy this convergence between classical and modern storytelling because I think that the work of art throughout time and how our interpretation of art and approach to it changes and I think that it's very interesting how that reflects on the values of society right now. Anyways, thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. If you like this kind of content, as I said before, please like and subscribe. If you have any thoughts on this, please comment and let me know. And I'll see you very soon.